Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India So hello and welcome to this NPTEL course entitled 20th Century Fiction where we're looking at Virginia Woolf's novel uh, Mrs. Dalloway. So we've had already a lecture on this and we talked about some of the themes that are the overarching themes of this particular novel. And this is obviously a post First World War novel that occupies one day in London. And the references to war are very obliquely done. Though. So there are not direct graphic references to the war but the effect of the war is very much there. It's some kind of a spectral presence across uh, London, across the metropolis. So the war is there as some kind of a reminder. You know, there's this, always this reminder of war, the references of war, which are made uh, sometimes very indirectly, sometimes offhand. Uh, but the indirectness and the offhand quality uh, is exactly what makes the, uh, the entire spectrality of war very, very menacing. Uh, so superficially, this is about Mrs. Dalloway, Clarissa Dalloway, uh, trying to throw a party at a London home. And the whole day is a preparation for the party that she's making. And there's also the other character, Septimus Smith, who is the, um, the war veteran who's come back to London after the war. And who finds himself completely abandoned and alienated uh, in a post-war metropolis. Now let's take a look at this uh, section which should be on your screen where the references to war is made, are made uh, very obliquely, very complexly. I and mean, there's a sense that the novel is trying very hard, the narrative is trying very hard. Uh, to tell us that the war is over, everything is behind us. Uh, but at the same time, the residual violence of the war is very much there. Uh, and there's a degree of denial about the losses the war had created historically. So this should be on your screen. For it was the middle of June, the war was over, except for someone like Mrs. Foxcroft at the embassy last night, eating a hot hour because the nice boy was killed and now the old manor house must go to a cousin. So again, look at the way in which even the losses out of the war are made into some kind of a banal thing, right? So because someone has killed, someone has been killed, uh, some property will go to someone else. So the banality of violence is something which has been described to us, the hypocrisy of the upper middle class uh, Londoners over here. Or Lady Bexborough, who opened a bazaar, they said, with a telegram in her hand, John, her favorite, killed. But it was over, thank heaven, over. It was June. The king and the queen were at the palace. And everywhere, though it was still so early, there was a beating, a stirring of galloping ponies, tapping of cricket bats, Lords, Ascot, Renelaw, and all the rest of it, wrapped up in a soft mesh of the grey-blue morning air, which, as the day wore on, would unwind them, and set down on the lawns and pitches the bouncing ponies, whose forefeet just struck the ground and up the sprang, the whirling young men, the laughing girls in the transparent muslins, who even now, after dancing all night, were taking the absurd woolly dogs for a run. And even now at this hour, discreet old doigers were shouting out, uh, shooting out in the motor cars on errands of mystery. And the shopkeepers were fidgeting in the windows with their paste and diamonds. The lovely old green, uh, sea green brooches in 18th century settings to tempt Americans. But one must economize, not buy things rashly for Elizabeth. And she too loving it as she did with an absurd and faithful passion, being part of it since the people were countess, uh, Courteous, once in the time of the Georges, she too was going that very night to kindle and illuminate, to give a party. But how strange on entering the park, the silence, the mist, the hum, the slow swimming, happy ducks, the pouched birds woodling. And who should be coming along with, the back, with his back against the government buildings, most appropriately carrying a dispatch box stamped with the royal arms, who but Hugh Whitbread, our old friend Hugh, the admirable Hugh. So the entire passage is full of very happy images, images of, uh, which carry a lot of life in them, vitality, lifelike qualities. But there's also this tension that you can see very, very clearly that it's trying very hard to look happy, it's trying very hard to look very vital and, uh, you know, it's almost like a, having a party every day. Um, there is this compulsive condition which is very thinly disguised in this particular passage, I mean, trying to come out of the world, trying to move on from the world as it were. Uh, and this compulsion to move on from the war is exactly which contains the trauma of the war. The fact that it's not been um, confronted with, the fact that it's not been talked about. Uh, the war is over is some kind of a temporal thing. It was a thing of the past. 
uh, some people have lost their lives, but then even those losses are mediated uh, through some markers of banality, uh, like you know, property, uh, the repossession of property by someone who is not supposed to possess it, etc. So all these markers are given to us in just to sort of banalize the whole thing. And there's this constant references to people having parties, people being happy, etc. Okay, so um, and that's something which we uh, uh, which we which we which we th should be paying some attention to uh, in terms of looking at the spirituality of what and Mrs. Dalloway. Okay, um, okay, so we have the reference of Peter Walsh, uh, who was a former lover of Clarissa Dalloway, and we are told that Peter's come back from the colonies. He's come back from India, uh, India, of course, being a British colony at that time. And he had married uh, some Indian woman there, uh, presumably some Anglo-Indian woman, and that's something which is looked down upon by Clarissa Dalloway. It's like Peter marrying someone who is um, racially different, and that, uh, that that disregard, that disgust that Clarissa Dalloway has is very important uh, for us to notice because that is uh, the typical white metropolitan disgust uh, towards people of mixed races uh, in the colonies. So even though the Anglo-Indians are ethnically British or ethnically uh, uh, white, because they have been quote unquote polluted with the mixing of another race, the sexual miscegenation that they've had, that makes them uh, something to be looked down upon and that's something that Clarissa Dalloway is exhibiting that disgust is precisely because of the racial miscegenation that has, that is embodied by the Anglo-Indians. Uh, okay, uh, and this is a very unflattering depiction of Indian woman, uh, Anglo-Indian woman, but those Indian women did presumably silly, pretty, flimsy, non poops and she wasted her pity for he was quite happy, he assured her, perfectly happy, though he had never done a thing that it talked about, talked of his whole life had been a failure, it made her angry still. So Peter Walsh over here, uh, he embodies a very important symptom over here, a symptom of decadence, a symptom of tiredness. And he too, he comes back to London and doesn't quite understand the city because he had left London uh, many years ago and he spent his time in the colonies and now he feels a bit alienated. So you have different kinds, different experiences of alienation in Mrs. Jalloway, the Septimus Smith of course who comes back from the war and feels completely disconnected from the metropolis as Peter Walsh who comes back from the colonies and cannot quite connect uh, to the vitality of London life and of course as Clarissa Dalloway uh, who feels alienated uh, because of her gender, because of her uh, seemingly, uh, seeming sort of insularity with the goings on around him. Okay, so that's something that is uh, important for us to understand. Okay, um, uh, and now we have a reference to Bond Street, which is a, which is a commercial place in London where you have all these high-end shops. And we, we talked about, we see how Bond Street is mentioned as this very fascinating happy space. So again, the, the, we have this very compulsive consumerism which is coming out from the war. And that compulsive consumerism was compulsive compulsion uh, to sort of, you know, consume by buying things, by trading parties, etc. is part of the denial package, part of the denial uh, narrative that is sort of uh, done, described and dramatized in Mrs. Dalloway. So it's like a you know, conspicuous consumption of different things right after the war, just to prove, uh, to hammer home the point that we have moved on from the war, and that uh, you know that actually accentuates the spirituality of the war, that makes the war uh, a more present thing, a more present phenomenon, uh, which is always there, the backdrop of this narrative. So we're told that Bond Street fascinated her. Bond Street early in the morning in the season, there's flags flying, there's shops, no splash, no glitter, one roll of tweed in the shop with a father where her father had bought his suits for fifty years, a few pearls, salmon on the ice bag. That is all, she said, looking at the fishmongers, that is all. She repeated, pausing for a moment at the window of a glove shop, where before the war you could buy almost perfect gloves. And these are the little touches of Mrs. Jalloway which make it uh, such an interesting and complex novels. The fact that we are told that before the war, uh, from this particular shop, uh, you can make almost perfect gloves. The obvious implication is post-war uh, is not so perfect anymore. The gloves are not so perfect anymore. The gloves are a bit, uh, you know, disfigured. The gloves are a bit misshapen. Uh, and there, there can be all kinds of readings out of it. Kind of one of the readings, obviously, is people come back from the war. The veterans who come back from the war, sometimes they had missing fingers. So maybe the gloves had to be made differently, had to be designed differently uh, post-war. So the perfection of the gloves before the war has been contrasted with the imperfection. And the imperfection, of course, could be a medical, a cosmetic compulsion uh, after the war because of the uh, sufferings, the physical sufferings um, uh, uh, that the war had caused the people. 
Okay. And our old uncle, William, used to say that a lady is known by her shoes and her gloves. He had turned on his bed one morning in the middle of the war. He had said, I have had enough gloves and shoes. She had a passion for gloves, but her own daughter, Elizabeth, could care not a straw for either of them. So we have this generation gap, which is beginning to um, be dramatized over here. It's Elizabeth. Uh, Dalloway, who is obviously the daughter of Clarissa Dalloway, seems to be very different from her mother. She doesn't care for the things that her mother had cared for. Uh, she didn't care for gloves, she doesn't care for uh, shoes, um, you know, which is something that she had always been fascinated with. Okay, um, and then we are told how the war, which was obviously fought in a more macro space, had had its extensions and spillovers in more domestic, more intimate spaces. Um, and then, you know, there's a description over here which is interesting. Her dismissal from school during the war, poor, embittered, unfortunate creature. Uh, this has been, uh, we're talking about someone called Miss Kilman, um, you know, who is obviously a story figure. But it was not her one hated, but the idea of her, which undoubtedly had gathered into herself a great deal. There was not Miss Kilman, had become one of the spectres with which one battles in the night. One of the spectres, uh, uh, one of the spectres who st stand astride for us and suck up half our life blood, dominators and tyrants. For no doubt, with another throw of the dice, had the black been uppermost and not the white, should have been should have loved Miss Kilman. But in this world, no. So again, the whole idea of Miss Kilman uh, being this other woman, or a uh, racially other, uh, you know, symbolically other, culturally other, and she's universally detested because of the cultural conditions around uh, London at that particular point of time, and that. Spectrality of the war is very much there, and that spectrality of the war it further accentuates racism, it further accentuates cultural othering, it further accentuates xenophobia because the war had created such a lot of trauma, such a lot of violence in the minds of people, and that obviously generates a xenophobia, which is uh, very, very palpably present in Mrs. Jalloway. Okay. Okay, now the next section is interesting because till now we've seen a series of very tranquil, abundant images of flowers and jams and lovely shops in Bond Street and everything seems to be very tranquil and seamlessly beautiful and everything seems to be very functional as well in this metropolis and the world is just a historical reference to something which happened temporarily at some point in the past. But there's no point uh, till this point, there's no reference to the war having created any difference in a cognitive system, uh, any difference in the way people perceive and, and cognize things. And then we have an example of this, how uh, a simple uh, accident, a simple sound in the street can actually shock people because of the uh, constant uh, fear of bombardment, the constant fear of being uh, attacked by bombs and how that is sort of eaten into the nervous system so that any sound which create, will, will create a start now, any sound will create a, a traumatic um, you know, trigger now, a days of view now. Okay, uh, and this is a reference that is mentioned over here with the sound of the pistol shot in the street outside. There's some kind of a gun shot in the street outside, everyone gets startled, everyone gets uh, you know, straightened up because of the gun sound. Dear this motor car, said Miss Pym, going to the window to look and coming back and smiling apologetically with her hands full of sweet peas, as in those motor cars, those tires of motor cars were all her fault. The violent explosion which made Mrs. Dalloway jump and Miss Pym go to the window and apologize came from a motor car which had drawn to the side of a pavement precisely opposite Mulberry's shop window. So it was a perfectly normal accident, it was a perfectly machining accident in the metropolis. But then the violent explosion reminds them of other serious and more sinister explosions which had happened during the war. So this is a déjà vu, a trigger which is constantly created, which can constantly be created by any kind of sound in the post-war metropolis. And that's what I meant when I said the war is there as a spectral presence. It's never really away from the minds of people to such an extent that any sound, any uh, noise which reminds them of any explosion can only trigger these traumatic memories in the minds. So everyone starts, everyone jumps up in fear whenever a similar kind of sound is heard, a violent explosion. So passers by, who of course stopped and stayed, had just time to see a face of the very greatest importance against a dove grey upholstery before a male hand drew the blind and there was nothing to be seen except a square of dove grey. So someone of some eminence was passing by. It could be a minister, it could be a person from the royal team, but someone was in the car and a passers by could just see a glimpse of the person from inside the window and you know there was this just one little moment where a male hand drew the blind and there was nothing to be seen except a square of dove grey. Right? So again, the visual narrative or the visual grammar over here is very, very cinematic. There's a sudden close up, uh, an accelerated close up on a particular person's uh, facial features to indicate the persona, to indicate the, the, the character, the, the person who is there. 
a person. Never quite mentioned who is a person. So the entire representation is very metonymic in quality, very fragmented in quality. Okay, so that's something which we uh, uh, which we which we see. Yet rumors were at once in circulation from the middle of Bond Street to Oxford Street on one side to Atkinson's uh, scent shop on the other, passing invisibly, inaudibly, like a cloud, swift, veil-like upon hills, falling indeed with some, something of a cloud, sudden so brady and stillness upon faces which, which, a, which a second before had, been, had, had utterly, been utterly disorderly. But now mystery had brushed them and with a wing. They had heard the voice of authority. The spirit of religion was abroad uh, with, the, with its eyes, with the eyes bandaged tight and her lips gaping wide. But nobody knew whose face had been seen. Was it the Prince of Wales, the Queens, the Prime Ministers, whose face was it? Nobody knew. So again, this is the uh, very contagious quality of uh, gossip, very contagious co uh, quality of rumours which are in circulation. They just spreads like clouds across veils and hills. So it's almost like a Wordsworthian uh, quality about how rumours spread across the city. So there was a talk about people seeing someone of importance, but no one quite knew who exactly the person was. So, and there was all kinds of speculations made. Was it a Prince of Wales? Was it a Queen's face? Was it a Prime Minister's face? Nobody knew. Uh, Edgar J. Uh, white wet case with his roll of lead piping around his arm said audibly, humorously of course, the Prime Minister's car. So again, the accent is important, the Prime Minister's car, uh, you know, sounds like a Cockney accent uh, that has been parried over here. Uh, and now we come to the other important character in Mrs. Dalloway, and that is Septimus Smith, Septimus Warren Smith. So someone who's been a war, a war veteran, has come back from the war, and now obviously completely uh, enervated by the trauma of war, someone who suffers shell shock, so to say, and most importantly, someone who feels like an outsider uh, to the metropolis as well as to the people treating him in medical science. So no one in medical science knows what's the problem with Septimus Smith. So he becomes the uncommunicated man, the abandoned man, to a certain extent. So the first reference to Septimus Smith uh, obviously reflects his condition. Septimus Warren Smith, aged about 30, pale face, beak nose, wearing brown shoes and a shabby overcoat with hazel eyes which had the look of apprehension in them which makes complete strangers apprehensive too. The world has raised its whip, where will it descend? So he obviously, uh, you know, there's a look of apprehension in his face all the time which makes other people looking at him apprehensive as well. Uh, uh, so presumably he suffers some post-trauma anxiety. Uh, there's always this anxious uh, look in his face, this anxiety embodied by him and that is something which we are told over and over again. So he is someone who is suffering trauma, the trauma of war, the violence of war is sort of suffering over and over again and that anxiety is showing spectacularly in his face. Uh, so Septimus also um, um, found himself unable to pass, it was almost like a crowd um, you know, of people. Now what's interesting is to see how despite the fact that you know, Mrs. Dalloway and Septimus never get to meet each other in this novel, the paths crisscross all the time. In the same way, uh, the narratives crisscross all the time. So the characters in each narrative sometimes inhabit the character in someone else's narrative. And only at the end of the novel do we find uh, Clarissa Dalloway having some degree of empathetic gaze at Septimus when Septimus uh, kills himself a gentleman from the window and his broken body is carried over by an ambulance. Uh, Clarissa Dalloway hears the ambulance the siren and feels sorry for the person inside. So that establishes an empathy between the two characters because both are equally repressed. And as I mentioned at the very beginning of this uh, uh, fiction, this particular novel, uh, it's very uncanny the similarity that was there between the uh, shell-shocked male soldier and a quote-unquote hysteric woman who was confined to her uh, bedroom, who was confined to her house, who was forcibly fed a particular diet to be strong and nerves again. How there is important, uh, there's a degree of overlap, medical existential overlap, experiential overlap with the shell shock soldiers whom nobody seemed to understand, nobody seemed to have any clue about what really happened to them. Uh, so in that sense, they too are abandoned, they too are unaccommodated, they too are misunderstood. And this degree of being abandoned, unaccommodated and misunderstood is something which connects uh, Septimus Smith and Mrs. Jalloway at a very experiential and existential level. So we told this should be on screen, everything had come to a standstill. The throb of the motor engine sounded like a pulse irregularly drumming to an entire body. So if you remember uh, Wasteland, uh, the fire sermon, uh, we have this image of the taxi throbbing, waiting. Uh, so again, the machines becoming more human-like and humans becoming more machine-like. And this is exactly what happened to Mrs. Jalloway as well. The machines are becoming more and more humanized. They move with like almost human motor movements, whereas the human motor movements are getting more and more numbed. Uh, there's any degree of sensation left. There's very little sensation left, very little cognition left. So the human nerves are drying up. So the entirety of Mrs. Jalloway is about a nervous condition. 
Uh, and this obviously connects uh, to George C. Mel's argument of modernity being a nervous condition as I may have mentioned already. Okay, so the trouble of the motor engine sounded like a pulse irregularly drumming through an entire body. The sun became extraordinarily hot because the motor car had stopped in the outside the Mulberry's shop window. Um, old ladies in the tops of omnibuses spread their black parasols. Here a green, here a red parasol, it opened with a little pop. Mrs. Jalloway, coming to the window with arms full of sweet peas, looked out with a little pink face, pursued an inquiry. Pearson inquiry. Everyone looked at the motor car. Septimus looked. Boys and bicycles sprang off. Traffic accumulated, and there was the motor car stood, and there the motor car stood with withdrawn blinds, and upon them a curious pattern like a tree. Septimus thought, and this gradual uh, drawing together of everything to one centre became before his eyes, as if some horror had almost come to the surface and was about to burst into flames. Terrified him. The world wavered and quivered and threatened to burst into flames. It is I who am blocking the way, he thought. Was he not being looked at and pointed at? Was he not weighed there, rooted to the pavement for a purpose, but for what purpose? Now, obviously, the last bit is the um, uh, very, very clear uh, depiction of the purposelessness the Septimus Smith suffered. There's no purpose in his life, he's just come back from the war. And we are also told uh, that he's just back from the war, so he, senses, he experiences a sense of innovation, a sense of liquidation. Everything is being liquidated, his sense has been shut down essentially. There's no empathy left as such. And the lack of empathy is interesting uh, because that empathy is what innovates them completely, right? And that also includes, uh, informs his purposelessness to a certain extent. So the whole idea of rooted to the payment for what purpose, for, for what purpose, and the question comes again for a purpose, but what purpose, right? So the purposelessness is important for us to understand over here, okay? And that's something which we uh, need to pay some attention to, okay? So, the whole idea of purposelessness is important for us to understand because, you know, here we have a man who once had a lot of purpose, who once was presumably patriotic, went to the war, fought for the war, got involved in this very hyper masculinist machinery of violence, and now he's back from the war, he finds himself a complete directionlessness. Uh, so, the complete directionless quality of Septimus, the purposeless quality of Septimus, is what is being emphasized over and over again. He doesn't have anything to look forward to. So, in that sense, it becomes a very perversely timeless man. So, in a sense, the time has left him. He doesn't have a past. You know, all this past is traumatic. And I mean, things of his past, everything is traumatic for him. The present is very, very fragile for him and he doesn't have a future. There's no integration possible for him in this post war metropolis. So, that becomes an important uh, uh, situation for us to understand. Okay. So let us go on, Septimus said his wife, the, a little woman with large eyes and a uh, sallow painted, f pointed face, an Italian girl. So it's also important to see how many um, white British men over here, they end up marrying non-British women. So you know, Septimus over here is married to an Italian girl. And it's interesting because Italy was not really an ally of England in the First World War. So that relationship that they have and the, the marital relationship he develops with this girl and obviously they end up marrying each other is important against the political uh, sort of context in which this novel is written. And her name is Lucrezia. But Lucrezia herself could not help looking at the motor car and the tree pattern on the blinds. Was it a queen in there, the queen going shopping? The chauffeur, uh, who had been opening something, turned something, uh, shutting something, got onto the box. Come on, said Lucrezia. But her husband, for they had been married for four or five years now, jumped, started and said, all right, angrily, as if she had interrupted him. Right? So, this very jumpy quality about Septimus, this very edgy quality about Septimus is interesting because he's a very fragile person. His entire cognitive system, his entire nervous system is sort of informed by fragility. And that fragility obviously comes from a trauma and this constant trauma and repression that is suffered in the war. And obviously the trench trauma is important for us to understand because you know a lot of the shell shock uh, medical condition actually emerged from the trenches. Sometimes it was not really about getting hit by a shell or getting hit by uh, any artillery bombing. It was just the entire experience of being in a very claustrophobic space of the trench and waiting for a bomb to come. And that wait for a bomb to come, the wait for a violence to come in a very claustrophobic closed space, that in a way generated the trauma. So in that sense, the closed confines of the trenches and the closed confines of the domestic house, uh, you know, that sort of connected the shell-shocked male soldier and a Victorian hysteric woman. Uh, and they, they seem to have a degree of empathy with each other in this particular novel as well, because Clarissa Dalloway is also a very, very confined woman. It's also some, someone who doesn't really have a lot of agency, apart from the superficial shopping that she does. And Septimus too, obviously, as we've just seen, is a purposeless, directionless man. So in that sense, there's a degree of empathy they have for each other, although they never meet uh, in this novel. And that's an interesting crisscrossing that we uh, see Wolf performing. 
okay, people must notice, people must see, people she thought looking at the crowd, staring at the motor car, the English people with the children and the horses and the, and the clothes, which she admired in a way. But there were people now, because Septimus had said, I will kill myself, an awful thing to say. Suppose they heard him, she looked at the crowd, help, help, she wanted to cry out to the butchers, boys and women, help. Only last autumn, she and Septimus had stood on the embankment, wrapped in the same cloak, and Septimus reading a paper instead of talking, she had snatched it from him and laughed in the old man's face and who saw them. But failure one conceals, she must take him away into some park. So the whole idea of Septimus, um, the, the transition that Septimus uh, has from being a warrior, from being a war hero, to someone who's shivering, someone who's a nervous wreck now, is something which is suffered by Lucrezia and uh, her wife, his wife. And his romantic past is very, very um, interestingly glorified past, is constantly contrasted with a very enervated and fragile present the Septimus inhabits now. Now we will cross, she said. She had a right to his arm, although it was without feeling. He would give to her, a giver who was so simple, so impulsive, only 24, without friends in England and who had left Italy for his sake, a piece of bone. Right, so again, uh, we have another example of uh, an alienated person. So, Lucrezia, who is an Italian woman that uh, Septimus is married to, uh, she finds herself completely homeless in London. Uh, she doesn't know anyone, uh, she can't connect to anyone. And as I mentioned, the political context is interesting because Italy was not an ally of England at that point in time. And we have an English soldier marrying an Italian woman and coming bringing her back to London. And that becomes very interesting. Um, uh, and it so undercuts the political uh, alliances at that point of time, which obviously shows how human relationships are formed despite the political relationships. And how the political relationships ended up consuming the human relationships uh, in, in the case of Septimus, consuming him quite biologically. Right? Now, the one phrase which keeps coming over and over again is without feeling. And the feelinglessness of Septimus is important because it's almost like a cognitive condition. He loses his uh, whole idea of attachment, the whole ability to attach to things is gone because of his traumatic experience. He cannot empathize with things, he cannot feel things. So he becomes essentially a blank sheet, uh, a completely emptied out person, cognitively speaking. Uh, and this is obviously a neural uh, situation, a medical situation, but also a very deep uh, and dark existential situation. And this medical existential uh, trauma of Septimus is interesting because that generates a feelinglessness. That generates this inability to connect to people at a level of empathy, a level of imagination. It becomes more and more inward looking, more and more introspective. And the introspective, inward looking self uh, begins to cannibalize itself in a way that you know, it takes away, it eats up all his feelings. So he consumes himself in that sense. So the violence of war is not just the physical violence of people dying in the war. And we have examples of people referred to Septimus's own friends having died in the war, which in, 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 in turn is, gives them survivor's guilt uh, for having not died and his friends had died. That gives them survivor's guilt, which adds to this trauma. So it's not, it's not just about that violence of dying in the war, but it's also this endless process of dying which happens post-war. And that, that makes it more painful for Septimus. And we see how the entire city of London is trying very hard and almost making a very compulsive and neurotic attempt to move on from the London, uh, from the war. Everyone's busy shopping, train parties, looking very happy, etc. And that becomes a very compulsive neurotic condition to very quickly move on in a very heavy hand away from the war. And he gets left behind. So again, in that sense, as I just mentioned, he becomes very perversely timeless. Right? Not in a positive sense of timelessness, but being left behind by time, being abandoned by time. Right? So everyone's moving on very quickly and he can't move on because he can't connect to things. Right? And that becomes part of the uh, problem, part of the trauma, part of the existential alienation that he faces as a human subject. Okay, so, uh, so the whole idea of uh, uh, being unaccommodated, the whole idea of being alienated, uh, you know, gets more and more, uh, gets replayed at so many levels. Peter Walsh comes back from India. Uh, he cannot connect to London anymore because he spent a lot of time in India in the colonies. He's met an Anglo-Indian woman uh, who Clarissa Dalloway hates because of her racial miscegenation. Uh, Septimus coming back from the war uh, cannot come to London, who is, which is very quickly trying to move on as a celebratory metropolis, uh, hiding his mourning status. Uh, cannot connect, you know, he, as a war hero, he comes back and completely feels alienated from the civilian life. Lucrezia, over here, who is an Italian by birth, who is linguistically cut out uh, from, from London, who is culturally cut out from London, cannot connect to any part of London at all. So we have all different degrees of disconnect embodied by different people. And of course, Clarissa Dalloway, who is very much part of the mainstream upper class British uh, gentility, uh, he feels completely alienated because uh, all she has is superficial markers of connect 
like shopping, train parties, etc. There's no real human organic connect that she has. So this constant uh, drama of disconnect, which uh, Mrs. Dalloway keeps playing over and over again uh, by portraying several characters, is what makes it such a complex novel, especially given the backdrop of the First World War, which is there as some kind of a spectral presence, a hauntological presence, if you will. It is there as well as not there. It's not been talked about. But there are, everyone has lost something in the war, someone in the war. Everyone secretly mourning, although trying to look very, very happy. So that ontological spectral presence of the war is something which uh, must or can never be overlooked uh, in the way the wolf presents this novel. So we continue with this discussion in the next lecture. Thank you for your attention.